Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness every morning, noon, and night. Lord, that you are so faithful to us, that you meet every need, that you teach us according to your word. And we are never alone, Lord. We are never alone. We are always safe in you. So, Father, just instruct us, we pray, that we be made in your image by your word that reforms and restores our hearts. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis 41. Somehow I think you knew I was going there. Genesis 41. I had mentioned it before. <clears throat> and I had kicked around, should I teach something different than the Parsha this week? Should I bring something that maybe is fresh and you know, there's a, a couple of series that I'm thinking about bringing in the new year. You know, both from the Tanakh and the Great Adashai. Is this the time? And I really felt that the Holy Spirit wanted me to teach this week's Parsha. I, I felt a pressing from the Lord. And as you can see behind me, I found this beautiful graphic. I sent it to Amanda. The title of my message today, as you can see, is From the Pit to the Palace. From the pit to the palace. You know, there's times in each and every one of our lives that we feel that we're either on that mountaintop or way low in the valley. I remember years ago, Amy Grant had a wonderful song about that when she talked about being in the valley or being on the mountaintop. And all of us, all of us as believers have those times in our lives where it seems like nothing could go wrong that we're batting a thousand, that, that everything is working perfectly, right? You know, everything is just, the bills are paid, the situations are perfect. There isn't even feedback from a brand new mic, right? Everything is perfect, right? And then there's other times where it seems like trial after trial after trial. There's a dear friend of mine that, that um, and I won't say who it is, but the Lord really called this person to, to a deeper walk with the Lord recently. And we were on the phone about a month ago, and he was sharing with me how everything in his life, since he's made that decision to take that bigger, deeper step with the Lord, it seems like anything negative that could happen has happened and is happening. And so he said, like, Rabbi, why is it like that? You know, if I knew the answer to that, Boy, I wouldn't have any financial needs. I'd just write that book and everybody would buy it. And... But the reality is we do have a book that tells us why we have those trials, why we go through those situations. And I believe that the manuscript, as it were, for it is Genesis 41, the life of Joseph. You know, in many ways, the life of Joseph is a strange dichotomy of events. In him, we see God's prophetic calling. We see God's anointing, profound anointing in his life. But in him also, we see a long, painful road that he had to endure. Now, as I mentioned before, if you've been to my office, you see the picture above, behind my desk of Joseph and his brothers. You know, it'd be nice that in every situation in our life, that we could just fast forward to that spot where every relationship is restored, every situation has been made right, that every trouble disappears. A utopia, as it were. But by purpose and by design, our Heavenly Father does not allow us to have that. And if it does happen in your life, you should consider it rare and a blessing. Most of the time, what the Lord allows, what the Lord wills for each and every one of us is that we do go through hardship, times of trial. I know that isn't, it's like, what do you mean? That's not, I came here to be cheered up, Rabbi. You say God wants me to go through hardship? What I believe is that God allows it for his purpose. He allows the hard times as well as the good times. See, God is calling us to something greater. He's calling us to a new plateau, to a new position, to a new calling, and a new understanding of that calling. 
But see, it isn't just like we jump out of bed, our feet go straight into our boots, and we're just ready to go. We have to be prepared. And a lot of times that preparation comes through times of disappointment. Now, I'm just going to pause here. Does anybody prefer that I use the other mic? Are we fine? Okay, because I'm hearing a little ding. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, in the end, what do we have with the life of Joseph? We have a patriarch. We have a man. We have a leader that we can all relate to. And it isn't just Joseph. Isn't it true? Every time we look at the patriarchs of the Bible, what do we find? Do we find men? And with the matriarchs, do we find women that have it all together? They have it all sewn up. They know exactly what's going on. They don't need any help. They've figured it out. They're in their A game. No way. Not at all. The people that God uses are the ones that the world says never amount to anything. A screw up. Who needs them? You want them on your pastoral staff, on your rabbinical staff? I don't think so. See, those are the people that God uses. Those that have a testimony. In the old saying, we hear it in African American churches, and it's true. Before you can have a testimony, you have to have a test first. You have to go through the hardship first. You need that test to get a testimony. And it's true, isn't it? It's absolutely true. The path of righteousness by design is a hard one. And we really see this in the life of Joseph as we look at this chapter today. But what lessons can we learn from Joseph, friends? There's so much to see here. Today I could center on a myriad of topics that jump out from this text, but what we're going to be looking at is his prophetic calling, that anointing for wisdom, and how he got there. See, the first place he got there was in the waiting. God is in the waiting. Let's say that together. God is in the waiting. What? I don't get it now? I've been praying so hard. I've been believing so hard. You know, I really encourage you when you have time, read the bulletin. I really believe the Holy Spirit gave this to me, the little, little uh, commentary that I wrote. I even heard some of you talking during the break time about the election and about the situation we're in. See, our hope is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. No matter what happens, that is alone where our focus should be. Alone. Alone. Even if our worst fears come to pass, it doesn't matter because he's on the throne. Yeah. Did you hear what I'm saying? It doesn't matter. But does it mean you don't care about things? No, I do. But it doesn't matter because he is Lord. See, that's where the waiting comes in. I think there's a problem that we have in the body of Messiah, and I'm just going to say it. We have it here in the West. That if I, we have this theology, maybe it's even an unspoken theology. It's certainly not a biblical theology. That if I pray harder, believe harder, work harder, do this and do that, that somehow I'll tip the scales in my favor and God will do my bidding. We even take passages out of scripture about casting a fleece before the Lord and so on. We take it out of context. And you know, sometimes the Lord does do that, but rarely is that the rule. This is why we talk about the perseverance of the saints. Because the messianic life and the broader spectrum of the Christian life by design is meant to be a hard one. Some people think, well, I accept Yeshua, so everything's going to work out fine. I'm not going to have any more troubles. I'm not going to have any more hardships. I'm not going to have any more pains because now I've got the blood of Yeshua. No, guess what? It's going to get harder than you've ever had it because it's supposed to be that way. Oh, not good news. Rabbi, do you want to be saying this? Non-believers can be watching this online. No. It's harder because anything that is really worth it is worth going through the hard times. 
And Yeshua went to Calvary. He went to a torture stake and died as a criminal. The son of God. You know, we're so upset about injustice. You want to talk about injustice. <clears throat> Crucifying God on a Roman torture stake. He said, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, I'm switching mics here. Because it's not bothering you, but it's bothering me. <laughs> we'll get that fixed. So, yeah, we could talk about injustice. Yeah, it's a little better, isn't it? Yeah. We, we could talk about injustice. And there is injustice in the world. But he who remains true to the end will be saved. See, the Lord is faithful. And everything that comes our way, comes our way because he allows it. And what is the first thing that the Father tells us? I am in the waiting. See, the course of history changes, but God doesn't. Let's look at our text. Genesis 41, 1 through 7. At the end of two years, two long years, I can't even imagine what life is like in an Egyptian prison during the time of Pharaoh. Certainly, certainly not club men. Am I wrong? And at the end of two years, Pharaoh had a dream. And he was standing behind, beside the Nile River. And there came up out of the river seven cows, sleek and fat. And they began feeding in swamp grass. And after them, there came up out of the river seven more cows, miserable looking and lean. And they stood by the other cows at the edge of the river. And then the miserable looking and lean cows ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. And at that point, Pharaoh woke up. But he went to sleep again and dreamt a second time. Seven full ripe ears of grain grew out of a single stalk. And after them, seven ears, thin and blasted by the east wind, sprang up. If you've been to the Middle East, that east wind. Ooh. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven full ripe ears. And Pharaoh woke up and realized that he had a dream. Two long years. Every day, Joseph hoping, praying. Well, that, that, that cupbearer said he put in a good word for me. I, I, I've been praying and believing. You know, Lord, you know, Potiphar's wife, she lied. I did nothing. I don't deserve to be here. Yeah, Lord, I know I learned my lesson about being arrogant before my brothers, but, but and a slave in Egypt, I guess that's a cross out there, but I did nothing deserve or to be in prison all these years, and now two more. Two more, Lord. Have you forgotten me, Lord? Do you think that Joseph didn't have these conversations every day with the Lord? And what was God's answer? I'm with you in the waiting. I'm with you in the times of waiting on me and not even really hearing my voice, just knowing I'm there. Knowing that I will never leave you. Knowing that I will never forsake you. Knowing that I will never abandon you. Knowing that I am faithful to you. Just know it. See, we can say amen to that, but when you're in the battle, when you're going through the hard times, the pressing times, when the epitaph over you is at the end of two years, Pharaoh had a dream. It's rough, folks. It's hard. But for those of us, and I think it's all of us, when we go through those hardships and we come out of them, you're grateful for what you've learned during that time. And if you had not gone through the hardship, you would have not learned the lessons. And some of you might remember this. I'm going to date myself just for a second. There was an old music video by Reba McIntyre. Everybody know Reba? 
Is there life out there? Do you remember? Does anybody remember that video? And she's gone back to school later on in life. She doesn't have a computer. She's writing a book report for her professor. And her children are playing. And when children play, right, here is things get spilled. <laughs> things fall over. And there's a drink, a child's drink, and it spills on her multiple page report. Now, I don't know why she didn't rewrite the report. But they show her in the bathroom trying to dry the report with a hair dryer, hanging up the sheets of paper. It would have been easier to just rewrite the thing, I think. I don't know, but I made a good video. And she goes and she gives the paper to her professor. Later, she gets an A plus on the paper. And then they show her graduating, but he takes the paper and he goes, I could have used it without, I, it would have been better without the stains. And she says, I learned more from the stains than what I wrote. I'm paraphrasing. See, that's our story. That's all of our stories. The stains, the hardships, the troubles. We learn from those times more than anything else. Does that mean that we want trials and we should jump to the front of the line and say, God, I just want more trials so I can learn more? No, that would be kind of off, wouldn't it? But God is in the waiting, friends. That is, we wait on Him. He speaks. He directs. He gets us to that place where, um, do I have your attention now? See, when everything's going perfect, sometimes we don't completely listen. And the flip side is true for us towards the world. This morning, preparing to come in, for a moment or two, I had the news on, and it talked about how Eric uh, Garcetti had decided in Los Angeles that he was not going to join the upcoming cabinet in Washington, D.C. And the reality is, regardless of political party, if he had done it, he was saying, you know, there'd be much here that I wouldn't get done in L.A. And whether we like that politics or not, the reality is they show the scene of L.A. and the way it is. And my eyes, my mind was fixed on it. Because I'm from Southern California, and it isn't the place I left. It's a horrible, terrible place. And these people, you know, everything has crumbled for them, hasn't it? Hollywood types, big money, means nothing. And the very fabric of society in California is falling apart. See, we can stand and we can learn from the lessons because Yeshua is in us. But what about the world that does not know Him? They're going to look to us and say, well, you know what, you're going through the same stuff, but, you know, hey, I don't see, you know, Faye, I don't see you crumbling. You know, Cheryl, you're not crumbling. Chad, you're stronger than ever. What's the deal? It's because my hope is built on nothing less than than Yeshua's blood and righteousness. And see, the world sees that. They don't know what they're seeing. And they turn and they ask, what is different about you? You're either nuts or you've got an answer that I don't have. See, God is in the waiting. And if we don't learn to wait, we can't walk in those things that the Father has for us. We just want to get out of the trial and the tribulation as quickly as possible. And hey, I don't blame you. I do too. Nobody likes hardship. Nobody likes pain. But if God is in the waiting, then that's all we need to know. And see, the Greek kind of Shah speaks of this, folks. Second Kepha, second Kepha. 3 9. I want you to write down that reference so you can look at it. It's talking about the return of the Lord, but this, this verse is so powerful. And I hear the gentleness of the Lord in this as Kepha speaks. The Lord is not slow 
in keeping his promise. Or some think of slow, slowness. As some think of slowness. On the contrary, he is patient with you. For it is not his purpose that anyone should be destroyed, but that everyone should turn from his sins. The Lord is not slow, as some think slowness, slowness is, but he's patient with us. See, he allows us to go through these times of hardship so that we can walk along though with those who do not have faith or have crumbling faith to show them the way. Because they can, they can learn not only to put their eyes on the Lord, but to look to you and say, well, if this person could walk in victory or whatever word they want to use, I can too. There's hope. There's hatifa. But if we walk in defeat and we forget and don't want to realize, don't want to walk in the reality that God is in the waiting, then the world will not learn it either. If we can't walk in the hope and the glory of God through even our darkest hours, then how can we expect the world to look toward Yeshua? Amen. And again, nobody likes trials. COVID-19 has taught us that. You know, I'm sick of it. Yeah. I'm also quite, I'll just use a Yiddish word, I'm for Clement. We've got Operation Warp Speed, this vaccine coming, and all these cities still want to lock down instead of just give them the meds so that everybody can be healthy. We're in a time of great trial. But this is where we need to understand that God is in the waiting, and in waiting on Him, He gives us the answers, the living prophetic words, just like God gave Joseph. I don't believe that God would have ever anointed Joseph the way he did if he didn't first put him through all those hardships from the pit to the palace. The palace would have never happened. It was all part of his predestined plan for him. See, God has the same thing for us. Secondly, God is in the position. Let's look at verses 8 through 14, shall we? In the morning, he found himself so upset, this is Pharaoh, that he summoned all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one there could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to the Pharaoh, Today reminds me of something wherein I am at fault. Duh, of course. <laughs> Pharaoh was angry with his officials and put me in prison of the house of the captain of the guard, me and the chief baker. One night, both I and he had dreams, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us. He inter interpreted each man's dream individually. And it came about that when he interpreted it to us, I was restored to my office, and he was hanged. Wow. God is in the positioning, folks. Fiahi, ve boker, ve patim, ruko, ve shlach, ve kra, el ko, katami, mitzrayim. In the morning, he found himself, that's Pharaoh, so upset, vitapem, that he summoned all the magicians of Egypt. What does this vitapa'em mean? Upset. Uncleos reminds us, one of our sages, that Pharaoh's spirit was so agitated that his heart, with that of heart, his heart, and that of anxiety, that it was literally like a bell ringing in his chest. Have you ever been so upset that your chest is like, and that's how he felt. Well, you know what? I would have felt the same way. Because there was demonic oppression going on in that moment. Who did he call to help him first? He called his advisors. Literally, they were necromancers. 
Does anybody know what necromancy is? It's a very dark form of black magic. Necromancy. Well, let me tell you what they did. The sages and historians both tell us that these necromancers, these witches in Egypt, would use the bones of dead people, dead necromancers, those who came before them. They would throw them on the ground to cast spells in hopes of reviving the spirit of the dead person's bones out of the bones to interpret prophecy, to do miracles, and to give insight. What does the Torah tell us about communicating with the dead? Cursed be you if you do it. But it's kind of funny and ironic here. The dream that, that Pharaoh is getting is from the Lord Almighty. And he's seeking necromancers, witches, Satan to interpret God's message. It's kind of funny when you think about it. Right? See, Satan cannot interpret the things of God. Satan is full of hate, misery, pain, destruction. He's the author of death, the famine that's coming. He wants to see all the people dead. Not just in Egypt, but in Canaan as well. But God is the author of life. And Satan's servants cannot interpret the message of Adonai. Only an anointed servant of God can do that. See, God was in the waiting. But now God is in the positioning. Do you hear what I'm saying? Joseph is being positioned for this great work. But it doesn't come without getting slapped in the face of it. A sense of mockery. It says here, when we look at verse 12, let's look at verse 12 again. There was with us, this is the cupbearer, a young man, a Hebrew, a servant of the captain of the guard. And we, and we told him our dreams. Now we're sitting there thinking, wow, finally, it's about time. But see, it's an underhanded compliment. Have you ever experienced an underhanded compliment? Or somebody's giving you a compliment, trying to make you feel better, or, or giving somebody's like, you know, saying, hey, this person's really right on, but there's just a little underhanded ooh along with it. And in the Hebrew, we find that here. And here our sages remind us this is what it was to mean. There was with us in prison a young man, a Hebrew, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him our dreams, and he interpreted them to us. And I was restored to the office, and the baker was hanged. But what does Rashi tell us? In saying that Joseph was young, a Hebrew, and a servant, or better yet, a slave, was to mean that in being young, he was just a fool. That's why he's been in prison for two more years. And as a fool, he's unfit for high position. Also, he's just a Jew. And because he's a Hebrew, he's stupid. He's ignorant. Because he does not know our Egyptian language. I bet he knew it better than they did. And he's also a non-person. Why? Because he's a servant. It's really, he's a slave. And how could a slave ever be adorned and given pricely raiment? So we see here why he's been maligned, why he's been disregarded for all these years, not just the last two. Well, he's just a slave. He's just a Jew. He's ignorant and he's stupid. He's a fool. He's a little boy. Remember when I started my message, I talked about those who speak ill of us and say, oh, that person will never amount to anything. They're a waste case. They're this. They, they say the horriblest things about people, right? We've all felt that sting in our heart, that knife in our back. 
But see, man does not elevate us to a place of position. He's being positioned by God. By God. And despite the mockery, despite the sideway endorsements, God was positioning Joseph for great kingdom work, just like he's positioning you and I. Just like he has been and will continue to do so. You may look in the mirror and say, who, me? No, you don't understand. I could never do what you do, Rabbi. I could never go and evangelize like Julian. I, I could never get up here on stage and sing like Robinson. I could never I could never lead a havara like Bill and Bonnie or Ron and Finn. Really? Who equips you, man or God? See, the Lord positions those he chooses. And he anoints them to do his great work. Didn't Moses himself stutter? And we call him Rabbeinu, our teacher. But see, during this time, Joseph learned humility. In the Targum of Onkelos, I love this. Speaking of this humility in the waiting, in the waiting upon the Lord, Joseph answered, The wisdom is not mine, but God will answer in my mouth and will bring peace to Pharaoh. Let's look at that text. Let's look at 15, verses 15 to 32, a little bit longer. And Moses said to Joseph, I had a dream. And there was no one who could interpret it. But I've heard it said about you that you, if you hear a, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Did you catch what's going on here? He's standing before the Pharaoh. If he can't interpret it, he's a slave, he's a Jew. He's a dead man. He better get this right. I don't know if you caught that. And Joseph answers Joseph, it isn't in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer, and that will, that will set his mind at peace. And Pharaoh said to Yosef, In my dream I stood at the edge of the river, and there came up out of the river seven cows, fat and sleek, and they began feeding in the swamp grass. After them there came out of the river seven more cows, poor, miserable, looking, and lean. I've never seen such bad-looking cows in the land of Egypt. And then the lean and miserable looking cows ate up the first seven fat cows. But after they had eaten them up, one couldn't tell that they had eaten them because they were as miserable looking as before. At this point, I woke up, but I dreamt again and saw seven full ripe ears of grain growing out of a thick stalk, and after them seven ears thin and blasted by the east wind sprang up, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven ripe ears. And I told this to the magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. Why, yeah, because Satan is not more powerful than God. And Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are the same. God has told Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows and the seven years are the seven good and, and the seven good ears of grain are seven years. The dreams are the same. Likewise, the seven lean and miserable looking cows that came up. And after that, the seven ear, year or seven years, and also the seven empty ears blasting by the east wind, they will be seven years of famine. This is what I told Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Here it is. There will be seven years of abundance throughout the whole land of Mitzrayim. But afterwards, there will be seven years of famine. And Egypt will forget all the abundance. The famine will consume the land. And the abundance will not be known in the land because the famine will follow because it will be truly terrible. Why was the dream double for Pharaoh? Because the matter has been fixed by God. 
and God will shortly cause it to happen. It was predestined to happen. There's no way around it. You couldn't pray it away. God had spoken, but as I said a moment ago, because of humility, God enabled Joseph to minister in this crucial situation. As Uncle o says, the wisdom is not mine, but God will answer in my mouth that which will bring peace to Pharaoh. And of this humility, Andrew Murray, don't we just love Andrew Murray? He says, humility is a place of entire dependence on God. It is from the very nature of things, the first duty and the highest virtue of all of his creatures. And so pride and the loss of humility is the root of every sin and the root of every evil. So why do we read that? It's because during those long nights in prison, those hard days, during that time when he was a slave in Potiphar's house, even looking back when he was in that pit and he was captured, betrayed by his brothers. In his naivete, he could have done things differently, but he was brokenhearted nonetheless. God used every one of those situations to work the pride out of Joseph. To work into him, massage into him by the power of the Holy Spirit, a true spirit of humility, so that he could hear God's voice, so that he could interpret dreams prophetically. See, we wonder why we have to go through the hardship. It's because we need to get to the positioning. See, during times of difficulty and pain, Adonai taught Joseph true trust and reliance on the Spirit. And because of humility and the anointing of the prophet, the anointing of the prophet increased. And Joseph was enabled by the Spirit to not only interpret Pharaoh's dreams, but also change the trajectory of the known world. What would have happened during this famine if Joseph had not been positioned there? And as we saw in our text, the dreams meant years of famine, but also years of plenty. And the plenty would provide for the people during the famine. It's much like what I wrote in the bulletin that you have there in front of you. That Joseph advised Pharaoh to take the next seven years to prepare for the dire times ahead. These times which were coming was not something that simply could be prayed or wished away. Nor could Joseph and Pharaoh bargain with God for a different outcome. The time of famine had been set, it had been determined. In fact, it could be said that it was predestined and that the job of Pharaoh was simply to prepare and keep his focus on the right place and the right things. See, that's our calling too. When the Lord speaks, our, our eyes and our vision and our attention on this and that and over here and over there, or just what he's saying. There's a famine coming. But I'm going to give you supply to thrive during that famine. So we've been in a famine. It's called COVID-19. We've been in a famine. It's called economic crisis and meltdown. We've been in a famine where the world calls evil good and good evil. Even yesterday, driving in my car, listening to the radio, I had to go home and check and see if it was true or not. They're tearing down more statues and they're changing names of schools in San Francisco. Why? Why? Because George Washington, Adams, Abraham Lincoln, even Diane Feinstein is not Black Lives Matter enough. So their names have to be removed from schools. Abraham Lincoln, Emancipation Proclamation, See, we live in a world where evil is called good, good is called evil. And yes, 
The prayers of a righteous person avails much, but God also calls us to persevere, to stock up our storehouses for the time of battle that is ahead. We think that somehow we can pray away what has been predetermined to happen. The Bible already says these things are going to happen. But where is our storehouse, friends? Is it praying against the things that God says you can't change? Or is it asking God to align us into the position to be effective for his kingdom? Amen. See, those that are following the adversary will continue to follow the adversary. And does that mean that things can't change? No, they can. But how does it change for us and through us? It's one heart at a time. It's always been that way. Our kingdom is known of this world. It's Yeshua saving the lost, delivering the broken. You know, we talked about this the last time that Doug and Kim were here. And the riots and this and were happening and what did their son do? He went out to LA, he walked with the people and he led them to the Lord. He didn't align with the evil, he declared the truth. Did he make it political? No. Because the salvation of one soul is more important than Republican or Democrat. And I'm telling you that as a conservative. We are called to kingdom purposes. But if we miss God's marching orders because we're putting our attention over here or over there, then we'll be disqualified for the work that God has for us in the future. And it's hard and it's dark. And the times that we're facing are challenging. And I believe it will get more challenging. Did you notice that God didn't tell Joseph, well, you know what? I'm just going to decide not to do this famine thing if you just do A, B, and C. No. He says it's coming. It's happening. There's no way of getting around it. This is what you need to do. And as a result, Joseph was elevated. We're getting to that. My document just closed. So God is in the elevation. 33 to 38. Therefore, Pharaoh should look for a man. This is what Joseph says. Talk about humility. Pharaoh's asking, what should we do then? These circumstances are so dire. I don't know what to do. Well, here's the answer, King. Pharaoh should look for a man, both discreet and wise, to put in charge of the land of Egypt. Pharaoh should do this and he should appoint supervisors over the land and to receive a 20% tax on the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should gather all the food produce during these good years coming up and set aside grain under the supervision of the Pharaoh to be used for food in the cities and they should store it. This will be the land's food supply for the seven years of famine that will come over the land of Egypt, so that the land will not perish as a result of the famine. The proposal seemed good both to Pharaoh and to all of his officials. And Pharaoh said to his officials, Can we find anyone else like him, like Joseph? The Spirit of God lives in him. This is a pagan, demon-worshipping king. The Spirit of God lives in him. See, Satan couldn't interpret the dream. Satan couldn't give life because he only brings destruction. But God had to humble this young man, prepare him for such a time as this, and then raise him up to speak truth in the midst of darkness, pain, misery, and despair. And yeah, it would have been great if the famine had not happened. Just like it'd be really great, all the stuff we faced hasn't happened and isn't happening, isn't going to continue to happen. But like, like Joseph, we need to be positioned and now elevated for the Lord's purposes. And how was he elevated? Through a spirit of wisdom, through the power of humility. 
through an outpouring of the Holy Spirit of the living God, and ultimately by giving him favor with both God and man. It's interesting, I love this quote. Many sages, teachers, even within Christianity, speak of this. This is what John Calvin says of this text. Joseph does more than he had been asked to do. For he is not merely an interpreter of the dream, but as fulfilling the office of a prophet, he adds instruction and counsel. For we know that the true and lawful prophet of God do, do, not, bear, do not barely just predict what is, will happen in their future, but propose remedies for impending evils. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you hear what he's saying here? I'm going to read it again. For we know that the true and lawful prophets of God do not barely predict what will happen in the future, but propose remedies for impending evils. Therefore, Joseph, after he had uttered a prophecy of the changes which would take place in 14 years, now teaches what ought to be done and exhorts Pharaoh to be vigilant in the discharge of this duty. And one of the marks by which God always distinguishes his own prophets from false prognosticators was to endue them with a power of teaching and exhorting that they might usefully predict future events. See, Satan has all of his plans, but God raises up his servants. And he fills their mouths and their hearts with his word. And he sends them out to declare the truth in the midst of darkness. And you know what? There's no darker place than Pharaoh's court. Can I get an amen to that? But we have a Pharaoh's court here too. It's all over the world. We can name many things that is Pharaoh's court in our day. And God's calling us to rise up and to declare the truth. Get in his equipment was forged the fires. The fires of life and health and healing in this equipment. It was forged in the life of Joseph. But how was it forged? It was through trial. It was through pain. It was through rejection, imprisonment, and even adversity. These were the things that God used to raise up Joseph. And I believe these hardships that we've been facing this last year has been equipping us for kingdom work. I was so encouraged with all of you. Can I brag on you a minute? When COVID hit, and we had to go completely online, the sense of unity in the congregation, the sense of vision, the sense of call and reaching out to those around us, I mean, the, people, the number of people that followed us online were in the hundreds, even in the thousands watching online because people were calling, connecting. Salvations occurred. Healings occurred. Every day, Julian would call me and say, I was just out running today. I led another person to the Lord. But you know what the sad thing is? The lockdown lifted. Things got back to normal. I don't like that normal. Not that we should be under a lockdown, but where is the fire, folks? We've been through the adversity, now we're being sent into the battle. We've learned the hardships, and through the hardships, and through the trials, but God's saying, now go forth in my name. Declare victory to Ocala. Your co-worker, your neighbor, your family member. See, the battle is not over, folks. It's only begun. It's only begun. And for Joseph, the end result was this. Egypt and the world was saved. Joseph was elevated from the pit to the palace. And the glory of Adonai was declared. And none of it would have happened, friends. If Joseph had not been left in the pit, if he had not been cast off into prison, and if he had not learned humility and how to wait on the Lord. See, the equipping is in the waiting, but we get equipped so we can go. So when I say, as I conclude, that God is in the waiting, 
All of the good and great things that God has for us is tied up in that waiting, friends. It is only in the waiting that relationship with God can be forged. And there alone, alone, alone can we be equipped for ministry. God is also in the position. When we have learned to wait, he will then position us for his glory. Without waiting, we would have never known how to be in the right place at the right time. It would have not even dawned on us. But because we've been equipped on our knees, he enables us to stand, friends. And God is in the fulfillment. When our hearts is truly sensitive to hear the voice of the Lord, then we are ready for the fulfilling in our lives. We're ready to be used by God for his glory, for the salvation of the nations. Because God is in the elevating. And when the spirit, when the rock rests on us, because we have embraced the waiting, we have embraced the listening, we have embraced the humility, then by the power of the spirit of God, all that we need will be poured out upon us. And we will go forth in his mighty name for destiny and for the kingdom. So I said and I'm just going to conclude now. 2020. People were so excited coming into this year. We didn't realize it was the year of the waiting. And now the waiting's over. The prison doors are being opened up. God's saying now when you go forth. Because I'm ready to position you. Appoint you. Anoint you. And elevate you. To a place of kingdom dominance. In my name. Receive his anointing today. Receive his encouragement today. It has been good that God has been with us through this trial. And there's going to be other trials. But we're equipped in God's name to go forth and declare deliverance to the captives. Father, we thank you and praise you for your work. We thank you, Lord. Um, that you have been with us through every trial and every situation. And Lord, you know our hearts, you know what we desire, but Lord, what we need more than anything is you. And we do pray, God, for justice. We do pray for peace over our nation. We do pray for peace over our hearts. We pray for blessing over our president. But Lord God, we ask you, Lord, that you would position us for the things of your kingdom that we would be useful for you. And Lord, we thank you for the hard times because Lord, it has taught us on how to go and how to walk and who to be in you and how to lead our lives. Mishon Yeshua. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.